Okay, so right now we have a benzaldehyde and acetophenone, I'm sorry, methoxybenzaldehyde and acetophenone dissolved into three mils of ethanol. And so what we're gonna do now is we're going to add the sodium hydroxide. And this is the point where we deprotonate the acetophenone, so the alpha hydrogen on the acetophenone. And once we do that, we're gonna see a nucleophilic attack of the benzaldehyde. And this is a remarkable lab in that you can visualize the formation of product. Have to be slow. Just get it in there. You can visualize the formation of product as the yellow starts to appear and you start to see conjugation. And so now what you can see is you can literally see precipitant forming. Okay. And that is your product. Okay. Ethanol is pretty polar. Okay. The methoxychalcone is a nonpolar substance. And so as the product is formed, it literally precipitates out of the incredibly polar ethanol. As a matter of fact, that's the reason we're using ethanol right now. Both of our starting materials, because they're much smaller organic molecules and do have carbonyl compounds, carbonyl oxygens rather, that can accept a hydrogen bond, they are slightly soluble in the ethanol, more so, a lot more so than our chalcone. And so this is particularly handy because again, our product will precipitate out okay, and everything else will stay in solution. So when we go to filter and do our recrystallization, we're gonna use those same properties. So now that we have this slurry, okay, we're gonna go ahead and put it into an ice bath and we're gonna let it sit. Why are we gonna do that? Well, of course, solubility is directly related to temperature. So when we put it into the ice bath, okay, the solubility of our compound will decrease with decreased temperature, and that way we can get more of our crystals to come out. And this is a very rough crystallization, so we're gonna make a crude crystal at this point, and then we'll recrystallize it in a little bit. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Now removing the uh, crystallized reaction crude mixture. And I, I stress crude because right now we have leftover benzaldehyde and acetophenone in the crystals, which is why we're gonna to have to do a recrystallization. If we were doing a melting point right now, it would not be sharp at all. It would be incredibly depressed and incredibly broad. And you can still smell leftover benzaldehyde. You remember what that smells like from your um, Grignard lab when you formed it. And so he's gonna add just a little bit more ethanol so you can rinse it out, okay? He's gonna be careful not to add too much ethanol because even though our product is mostly insoluble in ethanol, it has a slight solubility. And a lot of you guys lose product when you add too much solvent. Because why? Well, because it can go into solution. So we're gonna start the recrystallization process. And so what we're gonna do here is we're going to heat this up, okay? Um, Roberto's gonna add some ethanol, probably close to a few mils. Again, this is more art, less science. Okay, we're gonna heat it up, get it to dissolve. And this time, okay, and then hopefully rather at the end, we'll have some uh, pure crystals. Now that it's all completely dissolved, we're gonna take it, set it at room temperature, okay? And then after it's been at room temperature for about, or once it gets to room temperature rather, we're gonna put it in the ice bath for about 15 minutes. Okay, so now that we've hit room temperature, we're gonna go ahead and put it in the ice bath. Again, for about 10, 15 minutes. After that's over, we're gonna filter, get a melting point and an actual yield. Okay, so Roberto is going to wet the filter paper, okay? Because we were ready to filter. You see how that crashed out quite nicely? And you can actually see how the crystals are now this beautiful light yellow color, which is the color of our chalcone. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead and put that on there. And we're going to leave this on here for about 15 minutes. Okay. To help get all the crystals, get all the ethanol out. Anytime we use a solvent that can hydrogen bond and we have a site on our material, our final product, i.e. the carbonyl carbon, carbonyl oxygen rather, can be a hydrogen bond acceptor, we need to be very careful and make sure we get this nice and dry. If not, 
our solvent's gonna be all over our NMRs. Okay, so we're gonna lift this under the lamp, okay, until they look nice and, and dry. You can still see they looked a little wet there. Okay, so, oops, let me get you the focus here. It's not focusing, ah, there we go. Okay, so you can see how it's all still kind of clammy. Looks very wet, so we're gonna leave it on here for a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and do the same saturation test that we did on the Vidic. So we're gonna add first the bromine, okay? And again, you can see how this is a relatively clear solution. And you can see the color of the bromine. We're gonna add it and it's going to disappear. And it did indeed all disappear this time, okay? And so you can see the difference. So that's a positive test. So now we're gonna do the exact same thing with the potassium permanganate, okay? Which is going to form the syndiol and again, the manganese 4 oxide after the permanganate is reduced from a plus 7 oxidation state where it's purple to a plus 4 oxidation state it turns brown because the difference in the energy levels of the d electrons change that little tidbit was free and so you can actually see some of the brown precipitate okay this is damn it hooked let me shake it up Okay, you can see the brown precipitant in the bottom of the test tube there. Okay, so again, just like you did for the Vitig Lab, make sure you include the saturation test as part of your data. I'll be sending out melting points, NMRs, and percent or actual yields rather.